The emergence of COVID-19 has forced the legal industry to rapidly undergo a fundamental transformation. I'm Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal software provider. In each episode of Daily Matters, we'll explore what this new normal means for law firms, how legal professionals can find success while working remotely, and how lawyers can best serve their clients during this unprecedented situation. Today's guest is Paula Davis Lack, a trusted expert and lawyer who is the founder and CEO of the Stress and Resilience Institute. Paula, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Jack. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. Uh, and, and Paula, first and foremost, uh, tell me, how are you and your family doing? Uh, tell us maybe a little bit about where you're situated and, and what things are like there right now. Yeah, so I am in the Midwest. I'm in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and, and happily, we are all doing well right now. Um, I was, was just mentioning that uh, our shelter in place or stay at home order was supposed to expire, uh, I think, April 26th, and then just got extended to, I think, about the 24th of this month. So, but um, the governor is allowing some other non essential businesses to start reopening in phases. So, I can see how that's had a ripple effect. And I'm noticing more people out and about. I'm noticing more traffic in the morning when I go running. And so, it feels like we're we're kind of starting to lift out of it a little bit, but certainly not in, in any huge amount. So, And Wisconsin is one of the states, I think, where there's been more severe social distancing measures and, and more, more complete shutdowns than some other, some other states. Well, we actually, we jumped on the issue, our governor jumped on the issue pretty quickly and, mm -hmm. and, sh and shut down things in a pretty aggressive way. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of people have had various reactions to that, but but it seems as though it's it's worked. I you know we haven't had I think that that crazy sort of um, you know peak that other bigger cities have noticed. So right, I think it's worked. yeah. I, I think uh, we're we're in Vancouver, BC, as you probably know, and mm -hmm. and similarly here, BC, uh, very swift, very aggressive shutdown and response. Yes. And I, I think on the flip side, we've seen you know, real flattening of the curve and it's yeah. starting to plateau and hopefully starting to decrease in the, the not distant future. I just need my sports back. I'm craving <laughs> right. sports on some right. level. <laughs> I plan my whole year about like when the Super Bowl ends and then I've got my lull until the NCAA tournament. And so I'm ready for, for something. I, I am on the opposite extreme where I'm so out of touch with sports <laughs> that I didn't even notice <laughs> there's a shutdown and that there's <laughs> no big games happening and so on. So it's uh, been All less right. of a challenge for me. Yeah. Um, and aside from uh, sports uh, or the lack thereof, what do you find to be on your mind most right now? So I would say, first and foremost, just the health of my friends and family. I mean, that's, that's the number one thing. Um, I have a four-year-old. And so in my world, as long as she's okay and she's cool and she's happy, then like that's 98% of it. But I yeah. do have some close friends who are on the front lines. I have some physician friends and some nurse friends and family members. And so I'm usually trying to check in with them and just make sure they're okay. And, and so far everyone's healthy. And so that's good. But, and then separate apart from that, I mean, just, just thinking about my business and how, um, you know, I've really had to pivot as most people have and, and just thinking about, you know, what new opportunities could that open up and, um, you know, just thinking about the evolution and what I had planned and how some things are accelerating and other things are getting put on the back burner. And right. um, it's a very interesting time to be running a business, as I'm sure most people know. Uh, ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting time and, and challenging on a lot of levels, but a lot of opportunities emerging that, that we may not have anticipated uh, when we set out on 2020 and what we thought 2020 would, uh, would look like. <laughs> I don't think anybody thought this was going <laughs> to no. happen. No, anyone uh, who was fully prepared for this deserves a, a gold star for sort of, disaster preparation yeah, for sure. Right, exactly. Uh, so let, let's talk a bit more about your business. So the, the Stress mm -hmm. and Resilience Institute, this, this mm -hmm. sounds like something we need today more than, <laughs> more than ever. Um, right. and, and the Institute's mandate is to help organizations reduce burnout and build resilient teams, leaders, and cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is something I'm super interested in, in talking about today, not, not just because of the, the context we're in with COVID-19 and the, the information we might be able to share with our listeners, but, mm -hmm. but as the, the founder and CEO of Clio, I have an organization of, of 500 people, then, and this is mm -hmm. exactly what I'm, I'm trying to achieve. We mm -hmm. talked about building a, a human and high-performing organization that is yes. able to achieve high performance, but avoid the pitfalls of many high performance environments, which is 
burnout and stress mm. and 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 all of those uh those downside consequences of of demanding high performance roles or at least what can sometimes be the downside impacts yeah so, for sure so can you just tell me to to start a little bit about what the institute does the work you do and we'll we'll go from there Sure. Uh, we, we do a lot. We do. Um, so so pre COVID-19, we were doing a lot of um, in-person trainings and workshops and different um, aspects of consulting for organizations and law firms in particular. Um, I do work across industry, but a lot of my work these days is is in the legal profession. Uh, and so that's really now pivoted to a lot more virtual type of engagements. And so it runs the spectrum of, of talking uh, truly just about burnout prevention. So really what is burnout? How do organizations go about preventing it? And there are, like you mentioned, there are so many cultural factors that play into that. So I think that, um, you know, one of the things that people sometimes get a little bit wrong about burnout is that it's really an individual type problem. Um, and so a lot of the ways that organizations choose to address it is to do individual type well-being, stress management related programs, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, and those things are needed. Um, but what we know from the research is that burnout is largely created and driven by systems, workplace systems, so leader at the leader level, at the team level, at the organizational level, all of the values and processes and structures and systems that go into kind of running an organization. And so meaningfully being able to address burnout means you have to sort of attack it at all of those levels. So there, you need a very systemic response to that. So that is a, a challenge that I work on with a lot of organizations is first of all, just getting them to realize that, that this is really what we know causes this problem. And what's interesting is that this was such a huge problem pre COVID. And mm -hmm. now I think it'll be interesting to see how COVID either expands or accelerates the problem um, or maybe takes it in a different direction. And it's, it's been interesting for me just with my one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations that I've been having during this time. I do a lot of work with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis who are, who are burning out. And they're actually kind of happy right now because they're like, I don't have to go into work every day. I'm sort of, I sort of have this sort of space and this autonomy to kind of just hang and do my work on my own. And so they're noticing that from a burnout standpoint, in some respects, it's, it's actually getting a little bit better, which I find interesting, but not surprising. Um, so, so that's interesting. And then um, on the resilience side of the house, um, resilience plays into, it's not the sole kind of factor, but plays into and certainly helps with burnout prevention. And I taught, I've been teaching resilience strategies at the individual level for for so long and what I started to notice from the folks that I was talking to again was this, hey, what about culture? Hey, you know, this is great, but the leader on my team could really use this too and is part of the problem for why we feel kind of stressed and what do you say about that? And again, just kind of back to this whole systemic need to start to talk about these topics and address these topics, which is why I started to expand my work into not just teaching and training resilience at an individual level, but also at the leadership level, the team level, and then more broadly at the organizational level too. You talked a bit about burnout, but I'd, I'd love to dig there for, for a minute, just because sure. it's such, I, I think, an important topic and, and misunderstood as well. I think there's so many definitions mm -hmm. of what burnout is, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what, what yours is. How do you think about burnout? I think you made an important point that sometimes you see it as more of an organizational mm -hmm. level thing than an individual thing, and maybe you can talk about what it looks like at, at both levels. Sure. Uh, so this is a this is an issue that I deal with a lot with this topic because we use the term burnout really loosely in our society. Yeah. We use the term the term burnout almost as a replacement for stress. Like I've had a really stressful day. I'm just so burned out. Um, yeah. But really, it's the or it's the, alternately as as being tired. You know, just yes. sometimes the feeling of yes. putting in a, a good day's work and and being tired from that effort yes. in the same way that you feel tired after a, a good physical workout. Totally. I, I hear being described as burnout as well. And <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's hard, you know, when you don't have that clear language. And so that's part of what I try to do. And um, I try to follow the research as closely as possible when it comes to defining um, 
burnout for folks. And it's really just the manifestation of chronic workplace stress. So the key word with burnout is chronic. So you don't wake up one day and just say, woo, I'm burned out, right? It's, it's not this sort of temporary, you know, one day I'm just like, wow, I, I kind of have this. This is over time. Um, this is something that's been happening. And the research is very clear that there's three really big dimensions or components to it. Um, the first one is chronic, again, physical and emotional exhaustion. So not just have, we all have tired, busy days, weeks, months, and that doesn't necessarily mean burnout. It's this feeling like over time, I just can't recover the way that I used to. And I noticed that with myself. I mean, that's what launched me into this whole second career was that I practiced law for seven years and burned out during what became the last year of my law practice. I'm like, I'm going to go back and study this and right. help other people figure this out because it was such a bad problem for me. And I really was in a bad spot for a while. Um, so, so there's that piece of the puzzle, again, over a period of time. The second big warning sign or dimension is that um, there's this sense of chronic cynicism. So everyone and everything just starts to bug you and rub you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I talk about, you know, I would go into the office and I'd say hi to everybody and I'd like, beeline it right from my office, shut the door and just hope and pray that nobody bothered me for as long as possible. And that also included my clients. And so outwardly, of course, I was very, you know, very uh, responsible and collegial and, and all of that. But internally, I remember a lot of times just this sense of like eye rolling, like, do we really have to talk about this? Like, can't right. you figure this out on your own? And no, that's not the way to approach people who are coming to you with sophisticated challenges. And the problem with the cynicism is that it makes you less empathetic. It causes you to detach from kind of caring about the people who you're tasked to help. And that's a big problem. Um, and then the last dimension is a sense of inefficacy is what the research calls it. So I call it the why bother, who cares? Like, why are we having this conversation? You're not going to listen to my advice anyway. So why bother? <laughs> who cares? Yeah. Um, kind of a thing. And it's that swirl that kind of comes together into what we know burnout to be. Interesting. And, and then when you, when you commented on, on seeing this more as an organizational level thing in some cases, does that look different or, or how do you recognize, is this an organizational level problem or is this an individual problem and, and how do you how do you decouple those two things when you're looking to to manage people through it yeah so the research is very clear that so it's it's both it's it's an organizational issue and an individual issue much larger if you're going to kind of divvy up the kind of the or allocate the responsibility in mm -hmm. a pie it would be much much more of an organizational issue than an individual issue but it's a system and so everything is sort of interwound or inter, inter kind of connected. And so the way that we look at it is that um, we look at it as job demands compared to your job resources. So a job demand is anything about your work that takes consistent effort and energy. It's not a bad thing. They're not bad things. Some of them actually do good things in terms of helping our motivation. But when we have too many of them, and we don't have enough job resources. So the job resources are the kind of the energy giving motivational aspects of our work. That's when we start to see a problem. So Got job it. demands are things like um, having low quality relationships with our colleagues. I don't have enough autonomy in my job. I don't have a lot of leader support. I don't get a lot of feedback or recognition. Um, and then key job resources are some of the opposite of those things. I have a lot of meaning and impact in my work. I love coming to work because I love all the people who I work with and that, you know, kind of I'm plugged into what I'm doing. And so that's really the analysis that we that we look at when we talk about thinking about how do we help. And some of some of those things can be helped by helping individuals get better at managing stress and just recognizing where they might need just some additional skills or what have you. But most of that swirl comes in at the leader and team and organizational level. And that's where you really see the impact. So in, in the work you've done, you've, you've worked with major organizations, including Walgreens, Harvard Law School, uh, Coca-Cola, the, mm -hmm. the U.S. Army, among many others. Mm -hmm. You've worked with a real diversity of, of companies and, and entities. Um, you know, first of all, in the, in the work you've done, I, I assume you haven't encountered an organization facing the kinds of challenges that, that COVID-19 does. No. I mean, and I was thinking about this and thinking that really the 
I think the the closest thing I've seen to kind of this intensity in terms of a swirl of stressors was really from my military work, um, because when I when I was doing the work with with the army in particular, which was from 2011 to about 2014, they were still in such a high op tempo with all of the uh, with all of the things in the wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and and just, you know, dealing with dealing with all of that. Um, and so there was a lot of intensity about, um, you know, the challenges that the soldiers were facing and that they were bringing to the training and what have you. Mm -hmm. But, but this is so different. I mean, I mean, the military is in the business of people, as the soldiers would say, but we think about the military as kind of being in the business of war. And so that's kind of what they do. I feel like this is not something, this, this has nothing to do with what we do, this COVID crisis. This is completely upended really every aspect of how we think about working, about thinking about our health. Um, there's just not a facet that's almost untouched. And so... So no, it's, it's been very unique and different. And uh, to help organizations navigate this challenge, you, you recently published an online guide and, and checklist for organizational resilience, something that mm -hmm. can hopefully help organizations navigate this crisis. And um, this, this document, I think, is extremely useful, also almost mm -hmm. as a self-assessment tool, but also yes. to, to prompt the right kind of thinking around how you're approaching the crisis with your organization, mm -hmm. what your mindset should be, and, and so on. Can you walk us through a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish with this document and um, what you've seen, maybe some of the more practical exercises for folks to be? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, I love me a good checklist. So when I'm, when I'm doing <laughs> too, a training or, <laughs> yeah, or a workshop, um, my, my going in position is always like, okay, how are you doing now? Let's assess like what's going on now so we can start from from a concerted, you know, a, a very intentional entry point to figure out, you know, what's going well and what's not, so we know kind of how to chart a course of action. And that's really what this was intended to be for folks. And so um, kind of in the early, the, the initial part of the handout is a little bit more teams focused. So I wanted to give leaders and organizations a little bit of a structure in terms of thinking about, you know, that there are some very specific things that you can start to do before a crisis, during a crisis, and after a crisis to help usher you through it in the most resilient way possible. So we're already in COVID-19, so I don't know, I think we kind of missed the boat on the before the, before the right. crisis piece of the puzzle, but it's there so that organizations know, I mean, this certainly... I don't know that we're going to have a bigger challenge than this, but this certainly isn't going to be the only challenge that organizations face. There's going to be multiple mini challenges that have come and will continue to come because of this. Um, and just, then just separate apart all of the other challenges that businesses face because they exist. Um, so knowing that there, that there are some things for them to start thinking about, some, some questions to start asking, thinking about um, your team's capacity, how are their stress levels, what are they working on, do any of those things need to be adjusted, do we have to have conversations on the front end about any of that so that we're prepared for when something happens, and then when we're in the middle of it, what can we do, how do we be transparent, how can we still have and keep our same routines that we always have. And then when it's done, you know, who do we have to thank? How can we recognize people? What did we learn? Um, this is one of the things that the military does really, really well and a big lesson that I took from my work with the military is that they, they have what's called after action reviews a lot. So they're mm -hmm. constantly checking in with each other about what did we intend to do? What actually happened? What went well? And what would we do differently? And I feel that's a place in the legal profession and in organizations generally where we can really up our game. And it's simple. And there's research talking about how it helps team resilience and also reduces burnout, which I think is really interesting. So, so that's the first part of the download is that really wanting to give people that framework to think about from a team's perspective, what can we how can we start to build a more fortified team, an intentional team when it comes to crisis management? But then also at the organizational level, how did we do, right? How, how are we doing or how did we do? And so I adapted um, a tool to help organizations start to look at and pinpoint specific areas that they should be focusing on that we know build resilience at the organizational level. So we know that resilient organizations are really innovative. They're thinking about, you know, 
past challenges, what did we learn from them and how can we develop and build new processes, new procedures, um, new tangible resources to help us with future challenges. But they also have people who are really engaged, who are really plugged in, who are willing to kind of, you know, dig in and, and think about new ways of, of dealing with challenges generally. So you'll see in the download that there's 10 different places, again, for organizations to, to take a step back and look at organizationally, how did we do with the first five on that list being what the research shows is really, really key to having an like a resilient outcome versus a less than resilient outcome. Right. And, and, and maybe as we did with, uh, with the idea of burnout, I'm wondering if you can just spend a minute talking about resilience and, and mm -hmm. definitionally how you think about resilience. And I, I think that's another important word to spend a few, a few minutes on just understanding how do you look at it and what is the spectrum of not resilient to yeah. world-class resiliency? Like? <laughs> world-class resiliency. I spend a lot of time talking about resilience myths because I think a lot of people come to this topic with a preconceived idea about what they think resilience is from what we've heard from other places or what right. we see on TV or we think about Olympic athletes and things like that. And what makes resilience different from other topics like grit or mindfulness or well-being generally is that it involves adversity. It's all about how you mm -hmm. handle and respond to adversity, challenge, change, failure, setback. So if we're talking about resilience, that part of the equation has to be present. There has to have been or there has to be a failure, a challenge, a setback, or something that you're going through or just went through. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I think a lot of us think about resilience as bouncing back. So how do you how do you bounce back from that? So how do you respond? But a lot of my work is involving not just getting back to zero, but how do you grow from those challenges and educating people and talking to people about how there are growth opportunities from setback and failure and challenge. And that aspect of resilience is also really important. So it's not just getting back to zero, it's how can we leverage growth from that? Right. And so the key, the key aspects of those definitions are the same, whether you're talking about individual whether you're talking about teams or whether you're talking about organizations. We want to help the bounce back factor happen more quickly, but then also pivot to the growth aspect as well. So there's, there's wonderful, and this is part of the reason why I've chosen to kind of expand my work in these areas. There's, there's been a long, about four decades worth of research in the resilience as applied to the individual intersection, but a, a blooming areas of research in the last 20 years or so around how we develop this at the team and organizational level. And so knowing that there's kind of a research efficacy behind each of those pieces, I think is really important. So this isn't just what I think you know, factors into building this is really things that that have been tested. And so the building blocks kind of change a little bit, whether you're talking about individuals, teams, or organizations, but the outcome, what we're looking for is really the same. It's, it, it's interesting. It sounds a little bit like some of the concepts from anti-fragile as well, where we're talking mm. about the, the idea of the fact that, you know, this isn't about just grit and, and kind of yeah. gritting your teeth and bearing through it and and having that fortitude but but more the idea that look you, you've been knocked down you're going to get knocked down again what's your process for standing back up again as yeah. fast as possible but also growing while while you do it to get that much better the next time it happens and that's so important i'm glad that you mentioned that because i think a lot of people a lot of the, especially the, a lot of the lawyers who I talk to think that the expectation is that I have to have this invincibility or this invulnerability about myself, right? And this is just a covert effort on the part of the firm to make me bill 400 more hours and just right. make me into this superhuman robot type of thing. And I'm like, if that's the message you're getting about resilience, that's wrong, right? So let's, let's change that that narrative pretty quickly and squash that. Um, and one of the one of the pieces that we talked about with the soldiers a lot is that sometimes resilience just looks like muddling through. Like yeah. I am having a bad day. I'm not getting out of my pajamas. I'm just going to schlep along today. I'm not going to do any work. And that's fine. You know, I tell people, I wrote about this in one of my Forbes articles is that, you know, resilience also looks like getting in your car after getting groceries and having a cry, right? Letting the emotions yeah. out and processing the emotions and labeling them and dealing with them is a very important aspect of resilience. So it is not about perfection. It's not about always having to make the right choice. And I'll tell you, um, 
when I was burning out, if, if I had just stayed the course and put my head down and, you know, tried to keep persevering, I would have run right into a complete breakdown. And so part of what resilience is, is recognizing when you're, you're doing the wrong thing or you're on the wrong course and you have to take a step back and figure something else out. And let's talk a little bit more about law firms. You, you talked uh, about one, one anecdote from working with a, a law firm client. You, you work obviously with a, a large diversity of clients uh, from different industries, different spaces. And I'm, I'm curious what you see around lawyers in particular and, and, and maybe some of their challenges with respect to both burnout and, and resilience. Yeah, so I, um, one, of, one of my favorite aspects of my, my work has really started to develop just within the last six months or so. So what I started to do with some of my um, longer term law firm clients is that I wanted to pilot some workshop or pilot some um, coaching, some one-on-one -on -one coaching after my workshops because I felt okay. like, and what I was hearing from lawyers is like, this is great. You know, these workshops are a great first start, but it, they're not addressing like specifically what I'm going through. And that's impossible for me to do in 90 minutes to try and, you know, tackle what or think about what all of the breadth of challenges they're going through. And so what it's really allowed me to do is hear very, very in depth and keenly some of the really, really specific and tough challenges that lawyers are um, facing right now. And I, I kind of cluster them into four different buckets. So first and foremost, we talk a lot about stress. We talk a lot about burnout, the 24 seven, always on pace. I can't predict my schedule. And so that makes it hard to, you know, go to my cousin's wedding and have fun and enjoy it without like constantly being on my phone. Um, we talk a lot about that. We talk about, it's a bucket I, I still don't know quite know what to call. I call it leadership, but um, it's, I don't know what's expected of me. I don't know exactly if I'm on the right track. I don't get a lot of feedback. And I hear this from both associates and partners. So this isn't just a young associate thing. I'm, he I'm hearing this across the board. Um, and then a lot about connection. Um, I don't feel like I'm very connected to colleagues. I'm worried about you know maintaining a relationship with my significant other and my kids and being in such a high pressure environment, trying to square all of that together. Then a lot about culture. I mean, lawyers are not shy about talking about um, the cultural aspects, again, sort of back to our initial you know, questions right. that play into all of these factors um, that we end up having our deeper discussions about, so. And, and tell us a little bit about how you work with clients. You know, we, we, we didn't talk about that in much depth, but you've talked a bit about workshops and one-on-one and -on -one coaching. How, how does a, a law firm or any other client typically engage with you? And, and, and what does that process look like of engaging, uh, engaging with you and, and helping manage through some of these challenges? Yeah, so I mean, by and large, it's usually through some type of workshop format, at least that's the initial entry point. Uh, and so it will be, I think I've now talked to every single type of level of lawyer and program that exists, but um, a lot of partner retreats, uh, you know, women's summits, just general, hey, we want you to come in for this workshop series that we're doing, some tied to well-being, some more tied to leadership development. So it really just kind of, you know, runs a range. And then from there, um, you know, it's just really me being able to talk to them about some other avenues or pathways that we can build off of from an initial workshop. So that could be one-on-one -on -one coaching, that could be maybe um, expanding and doing a part two type workshop, which I've done a bunch. It could be kind of taking it again into more of the systemic realm. So a lot of um, leaders and teams based programs. So that's an area of my business that really grew last year was talking about the intersection of resilience and teams. And so um, being able to explore with them kind of how all of the different ways that we could sort of touch the system when it comes to these topics, both burnout prevention and on the resilience, um, the resilience side as well. So the coaching i'm i'm also expanding and this is this is part of my my again when i was talking about how my business is shifting a little bit i'm starting to think about more on demand type options so i keep thinking about the lawyer who might be up at 11 o'clock at night feeling really stressed out and doesn't have access to like you know pick up the phone and call and right. things like that and you know is there a little 15 or 10 minute module of something that they can listen to or that they can watch that might give them a skill or a technique or or something to to be helpful so those are other areas that I'm thinking about right now so I'm, I'm curious you've got this really unique 
vantage point of having been in this seat as a practicing mm. attorney and, and and now you you've built this incredible depth of knowledge around stress and burnout and resilience uh if you could call your former self and and <laughs> give give yourself you know one piece of advice something to um to lean on that that might have prevented the the burnout you mm. were experiencing what would that be Oh man, just trying to think of one thing. Um, so I call myself. It can be more than one thing, by the way, but but what's yes. at the top of the list? So I call myself a recovering perfectionist, people pleaser, achievaholic. <laughs> and so I would have loved to have given myself some advice about taking, and, and I don't, I, I have a hard time taking this advice even right now, <laughs> but but building in moments of pause and moments of reflection because I feel like as a hard charging kind of type A person, I sort of went from undergrad right into law school without really thinking about it too much and then into my career. And mm -hmm. I noticed this with a lot of folks who I talked to, you feel sort of then swept away by what happens. You're you get in your career and all of a sudden, you know, 10, 15 years have gone by and you're like, what am I doing? And do I even right. like this anymore? And um, we're, you know, high achieving professionals are notoriously bad at just kind of stopping every now and again and putting their heads up and saying, yeah, is this what I want to do? Is this, right. is this good? And I feel like if I had done that more, I probably wouldn't have run so quickly into the brick wall of burnout that I experienced. So, um, so that, and then also just recognizing too, I think back to the systemic, you know, conversation we've been having is that it's not all me. So that's usually also my going in position when something goes wrong is right away like, what did I do wrong? I must have screwed up. It's my fault. But understanding that that there were a lot of forces and challenges and pressures um, at play that were outside of my control and outside of anything that I could have done about it. So, so giving, I guess, myself a little bit of self-compassion, a little bit of a break with some of that would have yeah. helped. So. No, those are uh, both really, really powerful acts, I guess, really powerful tools to, <laughs> uh, to leverage. If you've got the, the ability to do a bit of self-reflection mm. and, and I, I think there's a lot of professionals, lawyers and otherwise that feel like they've just been shunted onto this, you know, really clear path <laughs> And, yeah. and don't have the introspection along the way of, you know, is this the right thing for me? And, you know, even basic questions like, am I happy, you know, doing this? And Do we uh, even allow ourselves to ask that question? Is that, is that right. even an okay question to ask? And it's, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, it comes up in almost every coaching call that I have, especially with lawyers who have been in it for a little bit of time, because their, their method, their process is sort of exactly what I did. You, you start, you put your head down, you do good work, you, you get recognized, you get more work, you, you know, you get put on a certain path and then you're, you're quote set and you're good. And a lot of them get to a point at some point where they're, they're, they stop and they're like, I'm not sure if I enjoy this. Is this really what I want to do? I have some leverage and some clout built up now. Um, can I maybe take this out for a ride and see, you know, what does this look like if I decide to maybe pursue something a little bit different? So it right. comes up all the time. I think it's just a fundamental need that we all have to feel like our work has impact, that we're making a difference. Right. Yeah, 100%, 100% agree. And I'm curious when you, we're now, you know, heading into two months or so in, uh, of mm -hmm. really being in the thick of this, this pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm curious through the, you know, workshops and, and coaching conversations and other interactions you're having with lawyers as individuals and, and law firms as, as entities, what's your take on how the legal industry is handling this, this crisis, both at a, maybe a firm level and an individual level? I think think they're doing as best as can be expected. I think you're talking about, I mean, this is a once in a century challenge that most if people that. who are living now <laughs> yeah. have never experienced unless we're talking about people who were, who were alive during the Great Depression. I mean, you're just, right. it's just such a complete game changer on, on every level. And I think that kind of back to the resilience question, I think just muddling through and every day, just kind of taking the different challenges that, that come up. I know so many firms are talking about and thinking about still pay cuts and furloughs and layoffs. Right. And, you know, what are, what are we going to have to do long-term to really financially be able to, 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 to make it through 
however long this is, this is going to be. And so I wouldn't say that I notice firms handling the, the challenge any better or worse than other industries. I think, I think everyone's just kind of in the same boat in terms of let's see what this day brings and we're going to try and deal with it as best we can. Uh, I think the firms that are being transparent with their folks um, who are reaching out, who are thinking about the person, um, being empathetic, uh, expressing those types of needs, I think are, are probably faring a little bit better um, than just, you know, we've got to look at this from a bottom line standpoint. It's, you know, there's people on the end of this and we have to care about their situations too. So, so yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's interesting that that comment you made around just muddling through it. Uh, I, I think lawyers, you know, they, they aim for perfection in so many things and, and being able to accept that, hey, the, the, the best anybody can do in this circumstance is, is maybe just muddling through it really runs counter to the grain for, oh. for a lot of lawyers, I think. Oh, Absolutely. And we, I talk about perfection so much in my workshops and, and definitely on my, in my one-on-one -on -one coaching conversations. And this is really kind of the ultimate perfection buster, this crisis right, right now, because right. no matter how well you were doing, you were probably thrown off course in a very big way to a certain extent. And it, it, perfection just isn't going to work <laughs> to get yourself out of this environment. A hundred percent. Uh, so I interviewed Cat Moon on this mm. podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. uh, she actually mentioned, I, I believe, a podcast she did with you earlier yeah. where, where you talked about, I, I think, some tools to manage the uncertainty that we're facing in this situation. One of the concepts she talked about was uh, this idea of, of holding multiple potential futures in your mind and just thinking about mm. what those might look like and and thinking those through carefully and seeing what are the you know what are the commonalities for example between those potential multiple futures that might exist and and ways that can help you navigate the uncertainty the COVID-19 crisis presents and I'm wondering if you can just spend a few minutes speaking about that and and tools maybe more generally that that lawyers can use to navigate I think one of the things that all of us find especially challenging about the situation is just the enormously large amount of uncertainty about what, oh. the, what the future holds. Yeah, so a couple of things there. There are a lot of lawyers who I'm talking to, who I've talked to in just the last couple of months, um, and we know this from the research. So when people go through traumatic events, and certainly not everybody is experiencing this as a trauma, but some people are. This is a significant adversity for a lot of people. So when we talk about resilience, we talk about the range of adversities. We have our little A everyday adversities and our big A, big, big challenges. This is, I think this qualifies as a big A challenge for a lot of yeah. people. Um, but when we go through those challenges, um, we can be deeply impacted and changed by them. Um, and the research actually calls this post-traumatic growth. So a lot of us are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder, but many, a lot fewer of us have heard of post-traumatic growth, such that when we get through and we don't like the situation, we wish it wouldn't have happened, we may still be in pain. This, there's nothing that suggests we love anything about this. But what we notice when we get through it and start to come out the other end is that we notice different um, opportunities for our life. We no notice deeper relationships. We notice maybe how we use our strengths in different ways and could that be a springboard for us to do something different. So I see that that cognitive process kind of happening with the people who I'm talking about. They're starting to have and deeply think about these types of things. Like is this, am I meant to do something different? Is this still what I, what I wanna do when I come out on the other side of this challenge? So that's part of it, sort of imagining what a better, what a different future could look like for yourself. And then just generally, there's a lot of cognitive, a lot of cognitive tools that I teach, but that I think are really even more important for folks to know about now. Um, so just thinking about what we know in, our, in terms of you know, counterproductive thinking, counterproductive thinking tends to happen in vague and ambiguous situations. Mm -hmm. It tends to happen when we're run down, stressed out, tired and depleted, when something that we value is at stake and anytime it's the first time we're doing something. Hello, like all four of those <laughs> yeah, check, things are check, like... Check there, right? That's exactly yeah. what we're going through now, which for me helps to explain why our anxiety is just off the charts and why a lot of our emotions are off the charts. They're higher and heightened than they normally would be. So one of the little strategies that I talk about a lot is um, we call it real-time resilience. So in the moment, 
Um, you know, maybe it's before you're about to hop on a Zoom conference call or you're, you know, you're going to go have a conversation with somebody that's really important and you're thinking in a counterproductive way, how can you reframe that um, on the fly so that you can perform in a better way? And so one of the ways that I talked about with Kat and her audience is to contingency plan. So you can think to yourself, and this is good to do ahead of time, if X happens, then I will do Y. You know, I used to think to myself, okay, if I trip walking up on the stage before my presentation, everyone's gonna laugh and I'll make a joke out of it, right? Then I'll turn it into a funny story for future presentations. Today, we could think like, okay, if, if our shelter in place orders get extended for another two weeks, then I will get my team together on a Zoom call and we'll talk about, you know, how things need to be updated. So it's taking purposeful action toward mm -hmm. a situation instead of spinning your wheels about something. And then the other way that you can reframe is to what we call put it in perspective. So just say to yourself a better way to look at this is. And so I know I had certainly some moments of catastrophizing when this all hit thinking like, oh my God, is my business going to go away and what's going to happen? And putting it in perspective meant for me to think about, okay, well, Another way to look at this is that I can build some on-demand content, I can focus on writing my book, and I can build my one-on-one -on -one coaching practice. So it's just, it's not BSing yourself, it's just simply allowing for a different perspective or even some optimism to enter the conversation. And so that becomes really helpful for us from a thinking process and cognitively when we're dealing with stress. Right, right. Super, super useful set of uh, perspectives and tools there. And in, in working with, with law firms, I'm wondering, this is a, a tough question to ask you to distill a lot into one answer, but when you, when you think about helping law firms become uh, more resilient, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a takeaway, kind of a, a take home message that you'd like to, to leave our listeners with on that front in terms of here's how to start increasing your resilience and, and realizing the benefits of that, that resi resilience as, as quickly as possible? So I think there's a couple of ways to answer that. First and foremost, there's a lot of science around the benefits of resilience. And so it's one of the th things that I lean on hard with lawyers and folks in the legal profession because we love evidence and we love, um, well, to a certain extent data, but we love evidence, right? And so, so understanding and really bottom lining for organizations, the true well-being and performance outcomes that exist from developing this skill set. And that's what resilience is. It's a, it's a skill set that we can get mm -hmm. better at, that we can develop. Um, you know, you talk about more cohesive teams, you talk about less burnout, you talk about a lot less depression, less anxiety, um, you know, achieving goals quicker. And we know this from our work with the drill sergeants and soldiers, the officers who came through our course were promoted ahead of schedule hmm. um, compared to the officers who didn't come through our course. So they made the rank of a one star general faster than their peers who didn't come through the course. So there are interesting. Yes, there's goal achievement and benefits really attached to making these skills kind of just part of your everyday um, part of your everyday course and then separate and apart from that i think that just punctuating the fact that there are and that you should expect and that you should look for and there are opportunities for growth when it comes through when it comes to crises of this nature that it's not always going to look like this and that you should be actively kind of preparing and seeking out and thinking about what you want that future to look like because it will happen there 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 is going to be growth from all of this and i mean i think it's probably one of the things that i'm looking forward to out of all of this is how are how are we going to function better as a profession how are we going to function better as professionals and, and are we going to take that seriously um, because we have really a, a quite an opportunity to make that happen out of this crisis i, I think that's 100 percent correct and i I share your optimism that there's going to be a lot of positive impacts that it may take a while for us yeah. to, to realize we're side effects of this crisis, but, mm -hmm. but many long-term impacts that will, will end up being positive impacts for the, uh, for the industry. Yes. Um, so we're, we're running low on time, unfortunately, Paul, mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed mm -hmm. our conversation and, and the time has flown by. Um, one, one item I'd love to, to spend just a minute on mm -hmm. uh, in our pre interview chat, you mentioned you're working on uh, a new book. Tell us a little yes. bit more about that. 
Yes, I'm working on my first book. Finally, I mean, talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Talk about an act of resilience. Um, this has been this has been when I started my business um, all these years ago. It was really one of the first goals that had like if I had to make a list of what I wanted to do, this was always toward the top of my list, and it's it's been challenging to say the least, but I'm really excited about it. It is a book about burnout prevention, but again, looking at it through this sort of systems lens. And so I've mm -hmm. decided to take a teams-based approach to, to tackling the burnout issue. And so I'm really excited about the new intersections and the new research that I'm, I'm finding as I'm frantically reading all of my studies. And if, if I turned my, my camera around, you would see like gobs of post-it notes and, and <laughs> <laughs> notes that I've got all over my office trying to organize organize everything. Um, but yeah, so tentatively titled Teaming Up Against Burnout to be published by the Wharton School Press at the University of Pennsylvania um, early, hopefully early next year, but um, at some point in 2021. Well, congratulations. And, and hopefully if there's a, a silver lining out of uh, yes. <laughs> shelter in place for, <laughs> yeah. for you, it'll be getting that, uh, getting that book over the, uh, the, the finish That's line. right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so Paula, r really uh, a huge thank you for, for joining us today. I'm, I'm wondering if there's one parting thought you'd like to leave our, our audience with, is speaking to them either as, as legal professionals or simply as people. Sure. I, I think that people always ask me, like when, when, you, when you go through a significant challenge, are there any guarantees? Are there anything, is there anything that you can say like this will happen? And there's only, there's only two things that I can think about, especially with a crisis that's this big. I always tell people that it's going to stink for a while. So we know that a hallmark of resilience is what we call embrace the suck. It's yep. going to stink for a while and you're going to have to, <laughs> you're going to have to realize that, um, but that it will end and that it will get better. So those are always the only two things that I know that I can guarantee for people is that it's going to stink for a while, but that I guarantee you that it will get better. And so if we can kind of keep our eyes, especially on the second part of that equation, I think we have a really um, amazing opportunity to elevate our work in this profession. That's a great note to, to end on. Thank, thanks again for joining us today, Paula. Really enjoyed our conversation. So many valuable uh, takeaways uh, around a skill set that I think all of us need to be developing uh, in a time like this. Thanks again. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters today, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit clio.com.